Hello to all your listeners and colleagues. Greetings from Kowan, where I've been living for the last 10 years, and welcome to the presentation of my book. Los Mayas nunca se fueron, o y hablan quechí. Alta vera fácil peten tres mil años. The Historia. A title that may be translated as The Maya never really disappeared. They are speaking Kekchi today. Alta vera paz en el petén. 3000 years of history. Many people, including Maya themselves, believe that the classic Maya who built the great pyramid cities somehow disappeared after their cultural collapse between 750 and 900 of the Common Era. Many Maya scholars think that modern Highland Maya have little to do with these cultural giants of the past. That is not true. This book argues and demonstrates that a large part of the modern Kekchi Maya are direct descendants of these pyramid builders. Back then, they spoke a Maya language called Chol. In the course of the centuries, these Chol speakers were absorbed by other Maya, mostly Kekchi, in the process losing their language. However, their descendants can still be recognized by their surnames. Many surnames today considered Kekchi are actually Chol in origin. This book is written in Spanish, like many others of my books. I've been working and studying Maya culture for 30 years, with the Maya and in the land of the Maya. I think it's nothing more than correct for them to be able to read my work. This publication was part of an educational project called Reconstructing Maya History and Religion with the Maya People. Together with several groups of Kekchi Maya, from Alta Vera Paz and the Petén. The project was funded by the Gerda Henkel Foundation. It is an example of the educational projects I've been working in in Guatemala over the last 25 years. Sharing and exchanging knowledge on the history and cosmovision with local teachers, farmers, college and university students, local NGO officials, Guías espirituales or Maya priests, catechists, many of them Maya. When living in Rabinal during the 90s, doing research for my PhD on the dance drama Rabinalachi, I came to realize that Maya people had little knowledge about their own history. That is not surprising, given the little history that is taught at school, which basically starts with the Spanish conquest. There is some scant, half-hearted information about Maya culture, decontextualized topics about Tikal or the national hero Tecumumam. Instead of soliciting a position at a university, I decided after my graduation to stay in Guatemala. When living in Rabinal, I came to realize another fact. The best way of doing Maya research is with the Mayas themselves. I specialized in the indigenous chronicles of Guatemala, learning the languages in which they were written. Being familiar with these texts, one recognizes the strong continuity of Maya concepts of religion and cosmology, though some of them are today syncretized with Christian beliefs. This continuity is due to the nature of religious concepts, which tend to be very conservative and, and resistant to change. This way, one can make direct links between, let's say, the Maya texts we collected of several dear dance dramas and classic Maya pottery scenes about the master of the deer. Before going into the content of the book, we want to show a book trailer we made. Remember, this was and still is pandemic time, so it seemed prudent and cautious to avoid book presentations with large, large audiences. That way emerged the idea of making a promotion video.
los mayas nunca se fueron. Hoy hablan que chino. Alta Verapaz y el Petén, 3000 años de historia. Un título algo provocador que busca despertar la curiosidad del lector. Escuchamos siempre que los constructores de las grandes ciudades mayas como Palenque, Tikal, Calakmul o Caracol, después del colapso sufrieron, misteriosamente desaparecieron. Una idea errónea, como explicaremos en el libro. Eso no significa que los mayas se extinguieron, no. Un gran grupo de ellos fue absorbido por los quechí hablantes. En este proceso perdieron su idioma. Hoy en día vemos el mismo proceso con los pocomchíes del polo chic. Están perdiendo su idioma ante el quechí. Los investigadores de la cultura clásica maya, epigrafistas, arqueólogos y antropólogos, plantean que los descendientes de las grandes ciudades clásicas mayas migraron hacia el norte, a la península de Yucatán. No se discute que hubo gente que migró hacia allá, pero es solo una parte de la historia. De estos investigadores, nadie, absolutamente nadie, toma en cuenta posibles migraciones hacia el sur. Esto se aborda en el libro. Cuando los primeros dominicos llegaron a Cobán en el siglo XVI, encontraron a los cholablantes en la estrecha franja entre el río Canquén, Santa Isabel, y las tierras altas de Cobán. Fundaron los pueblos coloniales de Cobán, Carchá, Lanquín y Cabón con estos pobladores. Los cholablantes fueron reducidos, asentados y ubicados en barrios propios. En Cobán, por ejemplo, en los barrios de San Juan Acalá, Santo Tomás Nimshol o en San Marcos. Hoy en día se identifica a sus descendientes por su apellido. Muchos apellidos quechíes modernos no son de origen quechí, sino de origen chol o cholti, idiomas mayas extintos hoy en día en Guatemala. Apellidos como chol, shok, kus, tiul, katun, tut, kapnal. Aquí tenemos a los descendientes de los mayas que construyeron las grandes ciudades clásicas de las tierras bajas. Mayas nunca se fueron. Hoy hablan que Chi. Alta Verapaz y el Petén, 3000 años de historia. El autor del libro es el antropólogo holandés Dr. Ruth Van Ackeren, que tiene 25 años de investigar la cultura maya con los mayas y en la tierra de los mayas. Desde hace más de 10 años vive en Cobán, Alta Verapaz. <tose> La in na quinchal salintenamit chikahbum. Lisum inkaba han shol. Hokama toho shestie. Lisum kakaba nashtie makachin kasiyahik katyolahik ho ahral choch. Shol haan hui sum kaba hual nauilru sakechi. Likaru inka nauno nakhan hui sum kaba ech. Chol. Nakeshtie naklisum kakaba nachal sahun nahtertenamit. Nimshol shkaba kwang sashben linim lanima ik bolai. Lishpoyanam sheatinak chol. Salishkutankil di colonia. Lipoyanam sheisig salishrokel nahe. Restikibankil. Un actenamit Santo Tomás Nimshol Arán Cobán. Sali atinopal rechut mayap hain chol cholti chol narashtiebal shu. Utme koshla nakhalan shu. Haan she kwang reahtia konel marah akainil. Haan nishpenil reahtia konel marah akainil. Haan shkwang
The video was shot in the beautiful valley of Chichen, near modern Koban. It's also the place where the largest pre-Hispanic settlement is located. It lies near the small Mestela River that passes through a cave, where modern Kekchi still come to perform their ceremonies before the earth and rain deity, Lord Mountain Valley, Kagwa Tsultaka. Chichen is not a Kekchi toponym, but Shol, meaning place of the cave. The woman in the video is Dilsia Sholtush from Kabon. She holds the title Rabina Gao, or Daughter of the Lord, of, of 2019 and 2020 because of the pandemic. Rabina Gao is a yearly held contest among young Maya women of Guatemala. She who best represents her pueblo wins. I knew when I picked the title of this book, Los Mayas Nunca Se Fueron Hoy Hablan Quechi, that it was a polemic title. Ever since its publications, I've had many comments by Quiche, Cachiquel, or Mum, Maya saying, and what about us? Are we no Maya? And of course they're right. The subtitle Alta Vera Paz y el Petén Tres Mil Años de Historia should give a clue of how to understand the title. The Maya in the title are the same Maya that are often mentioned in documentaries and websites about their mysterious civilization in the jungle of the central Maya lowlands. What happened to them? Well, you know, mystery sells. Not the very fact that they are still alive and among us, however, as an impoverished and discriminated indigenous group. The title is a mocking and ironic nod to these documentaries, but also a signal and an alert to my colleagues who study the classic Maya of the Petén and maintain that they have nothing to do with modern Highland Maya. The book seek to change this understanding. We did many book presentations in front of an audience, however always a limited number, and online, including con conversations and interviews. Yet our first presentations were on the location of the people who pro participated in the program, that is Raj Ruha, Sayas Che and San Luis Petén. One of the principal arguments of the book, hinted at by its title, is the question what happened to the descendants of the classic cities like Tikal, Kalakmul, Seibal and Karakol. Most scholars say they went up north, into Yucatan. Yet the dynamics at the end of the classic were just the opposite direction, with Yucatecan people moving into the central lowlands. This book shows that large groups of Cholmaya went south and were absorbed by Kachimaya, in the process losing their Chol or Cholti language. The book keeps following these Cholmaya through the centuries. We have a letter of a Dominican friar saying that by the 1850s there were still Chol speakers living in some of the barrios of Coan. The descendants of the great pyramid builders are still among us. In the first few online book presentations, I made mention of my methodology, lineage history. What is lineage history became one of the questions mostly asked in the ensuing interviews. It's a methodology that I've been using since the beginning of my research. Okay. What is a lineage? A lineage is a group of kin people bound by consanguinity. It traces back its origin to a first common ancestor. The lineage used to have a patron de deity, but it was also an economic unit. Lineage elders were in charge of collecting tribute and controlling and redistributing the lands they held collectively. But lineages hardly ever operated alone. Ruling lineages sought allies, forming clusters of lineages called Chinamit in the indigenous text. 
the indigenous chronicles are written from the point of view of the lineage or Chinamid. As for its architectural manifestation, in Mesoamerican settlement pattern, the lineage had its own building and the Chinamid was organized around the plaza. The advantage of lineage history is that it allows one to see Mesoamerican history at work. It shows that the lineage moved freely about the highlands, the lowlands, the Pacific coasts, and even beyond. It wasn't restricted by ethnic or linguistic barriers. Thus, the same lineage at one place may be Quiche speaking, in other Pokom, Kekchi, Chol, or even Nahuatl. The methodology of lineage history offers a more productive way to comprehend Mesoamerican history. For example, by breaking down the Quiche Confederacy to its three branches and successively to each allied group of lineages, the aforementioned Chinamid, and then to the lineages itself, has helped clarifying the history of each constituent part of Quiche society. It made me realize that the theory of the Quiche migration from the Gulf Coast of Mexico, together with the other post-classic confederacies like Cachiquel, Tzutujil, Rabinalep, is in fact a complete distortion of history. The theory was put forward by Adrian Recinos and further promoted by Robert Carmack. And it's still professed, by the way, in a standard work as the ancient Maya of the late Robert Scheirer. Again, it never happened. This migration tale served to the earlier scribe simply as an historiographical model to legitimize their political position and ancestry. Doing lineage history means also translating lineage names and locating them. Many lineage names still exist as surnames today. For example, the Kawek lineage. They are the intellectual authors of the Popovuch. The Kawek were the ruling lineage of the Quiche when the Spanish arrived. Kawek is still a very common Maya surname. Yet there are a few Kawek families in the modern Quiche area. Where are the Kawek? You'll find numerous Kawek in Baja Verapaz and in Alta Verapaz, mostly among the Pocomchi speaking towns. That provides us with some interesting historical information about the origin of the Kawek. In my book on the Shibalba myth of the Popovuch, I have shown they are originally from the historical Shibalba area, today known as the Franja Transversal del Norte. They were Chol speakers before moving into the Maya highlands. In other words, they were classic lowland Maya. The methodology of lineage history also made me look differently to Mesoamerican Im imagery. It turns out that Maya had a proper way of presenting lineages in their iconography. We have many anthropomorphic characters on Maya ceramics. They are usually interpreted symbolically as sifts representing the Nahual of certain individuals. It appears they foremost represent lineages. For example, take these musicians on a chama vase. We have the armadillo as the drummer, the taltusa, some sort of gopher playing the turtle carapace, and the nose bear shaking the maracas called chinchin. The armadillo reads iboy, the gopher ba, and the nose bear sis. It turns out these animals embody lineages very common in the area. As a matter of fact, they represent three out of the four lineages from which the actors of the dance drama Rabbi Nolachi were recruited in former times. Talking about continuity. 
In the book we elaborate all the aspects of the lineage history. We use modern surnames to support the central thesis of the book, that is, showing that many modern Kekchi have a surname that is originally Chol. We have a large section in this book discussing the meaning of these Chol surnames illustrated with classic imagery and glyphs. An example. Kankwen was a city on the Passion River. Its classic name, known from its emblem glyph, represented a turtle carapace, which reads Mak in Chol. And the infixed glyph reads Kin. Together, Makin. Makin is a very common surname among modern Kekchi. They must be descendants of people living in that city or in the area. As I said, the methodology of a lineage history offers a more productive way to grasp Mesoamerican history. Trade was an important motor of history in Mesoamerica. Merchants moved along a network of ancient roads which goes back to the pre-classic. They were protected by their own groups of warriors. Merchants and warriors were organized in guilds, which were made up of lineages. Guilds were an example of that body of allied lineages that we called Chinamit. This book focuses heavily on trade and trade routes. One of the ancient routes connecting the lowlands with the highlands was the Passion River dubbed the Great Western Trade Route by Arthur Demarest. We document its history from the time that Olmec used this river conduit to get to the jade and obsidian sources some 1500 before the Common Era, passing through its dominance and control by respectively El Mirador during the late Pre-Classic, Tikal and Calakmul during the Classic, and smaller local sites during the AP Classic. The Itza and Tut and Spanish during colonial time and indeed its control was one of the reasons for the land of development project called Franja Transversal del Norte during the 1960s and 70s. We also described the Eastern trade route following more or less what is today the common road into the Peten. It's through this route that Cholti speakers in the 4th and 5th century of the Common Era migrated along Lake Isabel into eastern Guatemala, becoming the later Chorti speakers. We also have made cross connections between both routes. The book also offers a number of new insights. It turns out that the area covering the south of Belize the delta of the Polo Chic, Lake Isabel and Rio Dulce, all the way to Quirigua on the Motagua River, was always an integ integrated zone from the classic on far into colonial times. Now, this area is marked by toponyms and hydronyms with references to the Amata tree. We know that the emblem glyphs of Kirigua and Pusilha feature a tree which epigraphers have transcribed as un and translated as avocado tree. However, the only colonial Cholti dictionary we possess, which is from the area that we are talking about, explains that un and hun were similar words and that it also could mean paper made of the Amata tree. The area turns out to be rich in Amata trees. Hence my suggestion that both emblem glyphs represent an Amata tree, explaining why the modern town of Quirigua is still called Los Amates. In the book I propose to call the area the province of the Amate, or the Amate province. Its entrance from the sea is called Bahia da Amatique, another reference to the Amate. 
As said, the bark of the Amata tree was used to make paper. In future research, we scholars should concentrate on finding archaeological and other evidence of a paper industry in the Amata area. The Great Western Trade Route passed through the area today known as the Franja Transversal del Norte, which is the land of the historical and geographical Xibalba, a transition zone between the highlands and the lowlands, full of caves among which the 23 kilometer long cavern system of La Candelaria. It's the land of origin of the Kawek lineage, the very reason they produced an unprecedented myth about the Maya underworld. Shmukane and Spiakok are no Kiche names, but Chol names. The rivalry between the hero twins and their monkey twin brothers has historical origins as well, in, in two competing lineages, the Kawek and the Bats, Bats meaning howler monkey, trying to control the trade from the highlands to the lowlands. This book amplifies the findings of my earlier book, Xibalba y el Nacimiento del Nuevo Sol, Una Visión Postclásica del Colapso Maya. An interesting detail emerged from our workshop with Kekchi Maya from Sayas Che. We know that the original name of Tikal was Mutul, as we have the phonetic proof for that. Its emblem glyph represents a lock of hair bound together. Recently, we lost the semantic evidence for this reading. But when discussing the image of Tikal's emblem glyph, various participants observed that they still use the verb mutmu for the rolling up of hair, like women do when it's hot and they roll up their hair. I checked in the Koban area, but there they use nutnu, meaning we have a dialectical variant, maybe related to the Chol origin. But it is, again, a fine proof of the benefit of doing Maya research with the Maya. The subtitle indicates we are covering 3,000 years of history. Indeed, the history of this book runs until recent times. The last century and a half, we witnessed a vast migration of Kekchi people from their Vera Paz towns to Belize and the Peten. We mark the three moments in time causing this exodus. The introduction of the coffee plantation economy, which turned Kekchi basically into semi serfs on their own lands, the forced labor projects on road building during the presidency of Jorge Ubico, and the brutal civil war in the 1970s and 80s. Most of our participants in the workshops were second or third generation migrants. Some of the narratives of why their families had to escape the highlands were included in this book. The extended time span of the recorded history allows us to make some interesting diachronic analogies. That is the reaction of Maya groups to calamity. Take the classic collapse in the Petish Batum. We know from research that in the 8th century the cities in that area suffered endemic wars. Although it's difficult to establish whether the intensity of the violence of the recent uh, civil war was somewhat akin to the warfare at that time, reactions of modern Kekchi and Pokomchi Maya are well recorded. They left their community and went hiding into the dense jungle. Colonial reports speak of a similar response of the first Itza missions confronting Spanish rule and violence, or the Cholti uh, colonial settlements of the Manche area. They all fled in the nearby jungle. True, archaeologists found that Petish Batun Maya abandoned their cities, 
but did they abandon the area altogether, as is the current narrative of the collapse? Didn't they simply retreat into what they call the sacred jungle, to return to normality when times calm down, alive on the banks of the Passion River, as has been their strategy throughout the ages? After all, we know that people kept living there until deep into the 19th and even early 20th century. They were our last Chol speakers. These are some impressions of my new book Los Mayas Nunca Se Fueron, Hoy Hablan Kachi, Alta Vera Paz y El Petén, Tres Mil Años de Historia. As explained, it was part of an educational project with the people of Rashruja Sayasche in San Luis Petén, and I want to thank them for their participation and for sharing their knowledge that is still amply present in these communities. Indeed, I still think that doing research with the Maya is very effective and rewarding. Let me also thank all the people participating in the production of this book, Juan Moncada and Maya Ritiul for their images, maps and drawings and the people of the audiovisual studio Sion Lab. And last but not least, the Gerde Henkel Foundation for sponsoring the project and the publication of the book, which you may find available on Amazon. I'd like to thank all the viewers for your attention and interest in my work. Future publications will be a new translation and commentary of the Cactiquel Chronicle Le Memorial de Sololá, together with linguist Sergio Romero, and a three-volume study of the pre-classic city of Camino Huyu. <laughs>